Hey everybody, welcome back to 32 All the Way with Doc. Got a new guest here today. We are going to be talking to Mr. Ian Knowles. He is responsible for the Neon Shadows podcast. Let's give him a little uh, intro here before we get rolling. Join private investigator Frank Dixon in this thrilling noir drama podcast as he solves mysteries uncovering a darker side to a city in turmoil. Uh, we'll announce all the uh, links and stuff later, but for anybody who does want to go take a look right away, it is on podcastapple.com. Welcome to the show, Mr. Knowles. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, not too bad at all. So give me, uh, give me a brief background. I was really interested with this because I popped it on, and I don't know about you. Again, we were talking for the camera roll. I'm a bit older than you. Uh, I remember when they used to show the old, they used to have the old reruns on night, the radio ser serials. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what this reminded me of. Yeah, that was, was that the, the goal. intention. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, the intention was you don't see a lot of film noir adaptations of really anything. You know, True. you don't really see like new film noir, really. You just see like kind of genre bending versions like Sin City, which are really cool, but it's not the same, you know. And uh, it's a little more comic booky. So I wanted to kind of hit something that is more like the old school radio plays the old like humphrey bogart produced stuff maltese falcon stuff you know i just wanted to hit in that area have it very very traditional with the noir but still add like a little bit of things to make it separate special from other things honestly from what i listened to it seems to be the way to go because the thing about the thing about noir that i always enjoyed from those old movies uh going back to even the 1940s, was there was always such an unusual or strange plot twist that I think the podcast is the perfect place for you because if you did that in a movie, it would probably cost a ton of money or like you said, it almost comes out like a comic book. Like I love Sin City. Sin City was great, yeah. but there were spots in it that you would have never taken seriously, even for noir, if it wasn't in that kind of style. Yeah. Yeah, the, the advantage of podcasts are the ceiling is, like, the, the cost is lower. So when it comes to breaking into actually making the product and finishing it from beginning to end, um, it's just a lot cheaper. It's almost free for us because I already have the equipment from the other stuff that I do. So now it's just up to finding people like voice actors and artists who are passionate enough to join my project and luckily i sure. found a really cool crew is there uh, is there an overall inspiration that you've taken for frank dixon or we got a conglomeration uh, here you know most of my inspiration for frank dixon would be a combination of humphrey bogart and jack nicholson from chinatown so those two combined, because Humphrey Bogart pretty much plays the same character in all of his noir films. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and all of his radio plays. And that's, that's part of the magic for people. But uh, so it, essentially Frank Dixon is a mixture of, of those two characters. It's just, you know what, some of those characters are going to live forever. And I, I've talked about people with this, about, about the writing. I don't care what kind of... Uh, what kind of genre you think you're in or, or what you're working on. It's just, it's awesome to see people refer to that because as somebody, I forget where we were, but somebody dropped the, uh, it's Chinatown Jake on some of my friends the other day and they were just totally clueless. And I'm like, man, come on, how can you not know what that meant? But uh, it's great to have those kind of uh, just hard boiled, cynical, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know want how to, to say get it. lost in time personally. Yeah. You know, I want to make sure that I can somehow find a way to like bring it into the light. It's not like I'm the only one, you know, bringing noir into this generation, you could yeah. say. But uh, I just want to make sure that it's like a cool story is out there yeah. in the podcast space. You're, uh, you're kind of blurring the timeline here because what I really liked about what I was listening to was it sounds fairly modern day, but you're not really giving anybody a time frame. You know, when they yeah. go see the when they go see the the cop and all that, and it's not you did not delve into the uh, what's a nice way to say this for people who are doing it, just the overall cliches. I think with yeah. the car, it's really easy to come on, mama, and, and that kind of thing. You you did not do that at all. Yeah, I, so. 
because I watch so much film and listen to so many radio plays and all that stuff, I basically am very aware of tropes. So some I like and they're iconic and I do insert them in where they fit, but other tropes like negative ones that maybe kind of create the negative aspect of a slow burn or something, I keep them out. Or I give you a red herring. I make you think that this is going to be like a traditional noir where the guy always makes this decision or the girl always, you know, backstabs the main character, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But I go the other way. Do you find it's a really fine line? Have you have you put in a trope and you've been like, this is awesome. And then when you hear your guys read it, you're like, this sucks. <laughs> like, is that happening off? <laughs> well, there's been things that are on the edge. So I have a, I almost have like a, almost like a cartoony level of noir character, which is um, the detec the actual detective that works with the private eye. And uh, his name's Detective Joe Sutton. And he's very boisterous. He's like a, you know, if you could visualize him, he's like a short, stocky, hairy, mm. old school blue blood cop. So he just like, uh, he's very like um, animated and uh, he's very, it's very much like a noir like police captain kind of thing and so like i wanted to keep that trope in there and i was concerned you know will it come through too cartoony or will it come through as a unique character there's just there, there's such that fine line between the stereotype and the parts of the stereotype being real and I'll, yeah. I'll give you an example from yours uh and please don't take this as an insult because i, I was a huge fan of the show but when dusty is introduced I just automatically went to corn fed in the Duckman series. Oh, I'm not aware of that. Oh, okay. It's a it's a cartoon series with Jason Alexander where the uh, oh, okay. the main private investigator is just basically an idiot. Oh, okay. and, uh, and corn corn fed is his sidekick who is the the genius is the moral center of the show. Uh, yeah, you don't really tell us too much about Dusty. You're leaving him to the side for now. Did this get explored yeah. as we go on? So yeah, there's a reason for that. So, okay, so basically, that's what I kind of figured. Yeah, in season two, you're going to get a lot more of him. Okay. The, so the scenario is going to split, and Frank's no longer going to be the only concern in terms of perspective. I'm actually trying something kind of new, because in noir, there's a lot of internal monologue. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying something new where when they're in different places and their paths are diverged, I basically have Frank and his internal monologue, and then a scene transition, and then dusty with his internal monologue on his adventures because they stay yeah. together for most of the first season but at the end they have to separate you just you just gave me enough of dusty in the beginning that i'm like i want to hear more from dusty so I'm, a, yeah. I'm assuming that's coming down the line now how how long are you envision this for you're saying that you're going on to uh season two are you thinking yeah. long term could this could you change it around enough that it would be like a uh, oh man uh, uh, like a true detective will change the the maybe even the era the timing all the way through or are you gonna would you like to run with these guys so I'm gonna run with these guys and the narrative that I build in the first season you'll see why it's a, it's a story that could definitely continue okay and uh, and I purposefully leave out certain people's stories like throughout the season almost every episode you'll get a little brief internal monologue explaining the backstory of a character from their own perspective um including the some of the villains okay. so um but some of them i purposefully leave out because you're gonna it's just another thing to add to season two well i'm telling you right now i can't wait for a dusty spinoff and a dusty t-shirt because <laughs> i was i was i was pulled in right away i'm like i want to know more about dusty <laughs> How are you finding things are working for you on uh, on Apple? Is this your biggest platform? We were talking about this a little bit before we turned the camera on. Is this the one you're most satisfied with, or would you recommend this to other people saying, that, you know, this is where to put your work? Yeah, so I, I use Blueberry as my distributor for my RSS feed, but I would say, yeah, my best response is Apple Podcasts. They, uh, I think they account for about 70% of my downloads. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I, I'm up around 2,000 downloads in uh, less than 60 days of being live. So I'm pretty wow. happy with that. And, you know, I'd like to continue. And I'm trying to, you know, advertise and market anywhere I can. 
Now, are they giving you any kind of a time frame as far as your content? I, the big thing now seems to be, and I'm a little ambivalent about it myself, but the big thing seems to be now is dropping your series. Instead of, you know, you're given a show a week, have they given you any kind of concern with that? Or is it just, this is up to you and you turn in material? It, all of that stuff is pretty much 100% on you. Unless you're working with an actual network, like Earwolf or something, you know, you don't really have a schedule or anything. You kind of just make it all up yourself if you're the creator. And so essentially what we did was I wrote, you know, content and I wrote enough of a script just to try it out, like a proof of concept for the show. And, you know, my first episode's only 17 minutes and mm -hmm. all the other ones are a little closer to the 30 minute mark, but I wanted to keep, um, I want to keep it short because I wanted to keep it around 30 minutes or less so that I feel like, you know, people wouldn't get bored or anything. I, Cause for me, you know, a lot of the emphasis on YouTube and with podcasts is to be hours and hours long so that you can keep inserting those mid roll ads and you know, it's built around money. Whereas this is just, I just want to deliver a cool story. Yeah. You know, again, I guess the, the evils of that, uh, you know, are, are, are you right? Like I have some, I, I've spoken to some people already that are writing in mind from where the commercial is going to be put in. And I, yeah. I don't know how much I agree with that. I mean, we're all trying to do this to, uh, to, you know, to make some money and whatnot. But yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that or not. What yeah, I mean, in the second season, the way I'm writing it, like I said, there's going to be transitions in between main characters. So if I, you know, if I wanted to, I could dynamically insert the ads in those scene transitions, which could even help my scene transition, you know, um, because it would be a obvious separation. Um, but yeah, I'm not too concerned with like mid-roll ads or preparing that content for that kind of commercialization. I'm okay with ads or something like that being at the beginning or end, but in the middle, it's just, I purposefully make it like not long enough. There's no time to get bored. You know, there's no time to like lose track of what's going on. That's perfect. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, uh, I, it's something I don't like to ask it as a question, but more of a more of a general thing. Like it just you know the whole oh you know I'm just doing this to do this. I, I think we'd all like to try and make some money out of it. For sure, yeah, I, I definitely care about it, and it would be amazing if I could, you know, get money from my cast. That'd be great yeah. because they're so passionate and they've like especially the main characters. They put in a lot of work reading the script, doing their lines on their own time. Um, you know, I would like to be able to get them all equipment too, because I'm the one with pretty much the best equipment and, you know, the, with the pandemic and everything, it'd be really, it'd be just significantly better with everyone's schedules if we yeah. could record remotely. Yeah. Uh, are these, uh, are these professional people? Are these contacts? Are these friends? How did this all turn into your cast? A couple of them. Uh, so Dusty and also Jonah, which is one of the villains in season one. Um, that's my best friend, Dan Faulkner. Okay. Um, and so he also does like concept art design too. He designed the print that we give out to our backers on uh, Indiegogo and Patreon. So, um, so yeah, if you go to Patreon, Neon Shadows or Indiegogo, you can, uh, you know, donate money you could become part of like packages get physical goodies and as well as like special like bonus episodes and stuff like that but um his fiance is our only female voice actor right now um she does the voice of lady which will come in i think episode two is where you actually get to talk to her and then um she also plays a barroom singer Cordelia so and we did the the thing I'm most proud of is um we made the theme song and the barroom song that Cordelia sings we made it all in-house um Great. the guy who voices Joe Sutton he produced the music and I helped where I could with that and then I wrote the lyrics and then Amber who voices the 
two female characters. She also sang the songs. Great. Uh, how long are we looking to put one of these things together? Because I, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, mine, you know, mine are pretty well just live. And I, I'd like to get to the point where I'm doing some editing, but listen to the background and yours and the voices, the cars, people going up the stairs. How long are, is it taking you to put this all together? So when you're initializing your database, like when you're getting your sound effects and you're either making them yourself or you're pulling them from like royalty free libraries that are of a high quality. I mean, the first few episodes, you're looking at basically an hour per minute of produced footage just for the sound engineering, wow. you know, not the writing or the voice acting, just the sound engineering of the environment. So. I'm assuming like a lot of other skills that that will improve as time goes on for you guys, or you'll be yeah. having a, your own, like, for example, during the day, I'm a teacher. The first couple of years were a little rough, but now I have my own database to say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Hopefully yeah. the same with you guys where it's never going to, you know, you're never going to pop off an episode in half an hour, but, but hopefully it'll move a little bit faster. Yeah. Especially when it comes to editing. So essentially right now I'm in the writing phase for season two. And then as I write, I dish out the script per episode to all my, like we have a company Google drive and basically the whole cast looks it over and then they find their parts and then they start voicing act, acting it with each other and having fun, you know, figuring it out. And I also take feedback too, because, you know, sometimes when you're in a, like a zone writing, especially when you're essentially writing for other people, you know, sometimes somebody may not say a word it might sound stupid, even though when you wrote it down, it was, you know, artistic, you know, mm -hmm. verbal filigree. But then when so when somebody actually speaks it, it's just like, oh, no, that that sounds weird. <laughs> you know, so uh, I take feedback from my cast as I write. And then when I'm done with the script and everybody's gone through their stuff, then I go through my stuff while they start voice acting. And then I finish up my lines last and then uh, I engineer all the sound together at the end. I just, you know what, tremendous respect for uh, doing the job that you did so far because I've tried to edit mine, my, you know, and you cut it just that half second. I'm like, that's not where I wanted to cut. And just, again, I'm, I'm sure it's a skill like everything else, but I, I, was, I was super impressed for a first time one that how there was a nice flow, how there was no, I, you know, I'm sure somebody will nitpick you down the line, but there was no mistakes in the background. There was nothing that, didn't fit in I, I can't believe how many people have trouble adjusting the volume or you know the guy's screaming one minute and you can't hear him the next yours yeah, flowed very nicely yeah thanks that's a that's a huge concern you know because like especially for the first season during growing pains of figuring out who's going what who's going where what are we doing with this that that so basically and everybody talks differently into the microphone so next season will be even better at it um mm -hmm. yeah some people weren't the same so there's there was a lot of like level adjustments uh even with people doing even with the same person there'd be different levels um because they would like sit back from the mic or they would scoot up too close or something and then i would have to take the best take and then i'd have to uh it's called normalizing on the sound mm -hmm. engineering software i have but i use a reaper it's a free okay software and it's amazing for editing it, it really is for for free software it really knocks out of the park honestly so you've never really had anybody in the same room at the same time so to speak um just yeah i mean there's been a couple voice actors in the same room but for the most part yeah i've had to, because of the crazy schedules and covid and mm -hmm. half of us are still working half of us aren't you know so it's the the schedule's crazy and my my day job is uh second shift so it really just kind of destroys your whole day yeah 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 it's true I do, like i said it's off to a great start i'm, I'm gonna try and recommend it to everybody i'm gonna put all the links up neon shadows podcast everybody can find it on podcast apple and then you were saying also to look for it on blueberry yeah uh, blueberry is the distributor and they send it everywhere so you can see okay. it on iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify, you can, and we just got approved on Amazon database. So you basically can just open up your Alexa and say, Alexa, play Neon Shadows podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'll have to try that. I'll have to try that tonight when I'm going to bed. <laughs> Flip it on there. Is there any of, uh, any, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Any idea of flipping this into a uh, written word, flipping it into an actual small kind of neon shadows podcast movie somewhere down the line, or are you guys happy with staying in the format you're in? So we're open to something like a feature film, whether it's in podcast form or live action. Live action is really tough and expensive to shoot, but mm. um, we also consider animation because I could definitely see an animation being the route and I would be totally cool with that or a graphic novel, you know, cause uh, it sounds like it would fit perfectly into it. In, in, from, from what I've listened to so far, it sounds like it would fit in perfectly with some type of graphic novel. Yeah. Uh, Dan Faulkner is actually an amazing artist. I've done all the art for the show other than the poster, but uh, not because I'm better than him. It's just cause I'm faster with digital art, <laughs> but uh, he is like, stellar he's amazing so if we were to do something like a comic book uh or graphic novel adaptation he would probably be the lead on that one that's great guys everybody i recommend this wholeheartedly uh if you're going to go on twitter neon shadows pod if you're going on apple obviously under the under the same one check on his patreon it seems like something that people might really want to uh to uh start helping fund so they can get those extras from you. Sounds yeah. really great. Uh, I thank you so much, Ian, for your time. And everybody, thank you for turning into uh, 32 all the way. I'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks. Thanks, man.